Good morning. All right, it's almost that time. Probably another 10 minutes it'll be the right time, Adventist time, but uh, we're going to start real time instead um, this morning. Those of you that are online, welcome. Glad that you're with us. Hope that you um, can follow along um, with our Sabbath school. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer before we start. Father, we're so thankful that you love us, that you are here to help us to learn about you. Father, don't speak to our ears this morning. Speak to our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right. Um, We're going to get our PowerPoint going here. Yeah, that's right, that's right. So today's lesson is called End Time Deceptions. Thank you. Um, as many of you know, I like to, to um, rename our Sabbath school lesson sometimes. And so I renamed our Sabbath school lesson Dead Men Tell No Tales. For the last quarter, basically, we've really dealt with one issue. One issue, the whole quarter. Can somebody tell me what that issue is? Death, but more than that is the immortality of the soul. That's really what we've dealt with this whole quarter. Whether there are spirits and and we've talked about all different kinds of things, and so today is another one of those lessons on immortality of the soul coming from a different perspective. There's a film, an Adventist film actually, on YouTube um, called Beware of Angels. Have you heard of that? It's a, it's a really nice film, and I encourage you Um, If you want to take a picture of this slide so that you have the YouTube um, the the YouTube link so that you can go and um, watch this short film um, on Beware of Angels. Angels are everywhere today, aren't they? Yeah, I mean you see them in movies You see them um, in video games and all kinds of things. There are angels. We saw some last night, right? Yeah, there are some wandering around in the back. Matter of fact, she uh, came into my booth a few times last night. Um, So I was visited by angels last night. Um, So I encourage you to to, uh, take a few minutes this afternoon or tomorrow and watch this short um, film. The biggest threat, in my almost humble opinion, to Christianity is humanism. Humanism, right? What does humanism say? You see, the American Humanists Association says good without God. Good without a God. Is that possible? Can you do good and be a humanist? I mean, you can, you can feed the hungry, right, as a humanist. You can give donations to a really nice animal rescue as a humanist. So, Mike, that's a moralist more than... Um, good inside of you. So they say you can do good without God. The whole idea, see, I I disagree with their premise, good without a God, because who is God to a humanist? The humanist, I'm God. I'm God. I make my own decisions. I decide what's right and wrong. I decide what's 
valuable and invaluable um, on, a, on a Christian level, on a, on a big level. And so I am God. So good without a God doesn't work for me because good without self. That, see, they're saying they can do good themselves and they are good. Where we as Christians say, all good comes from God. And we only then reflect that good, right, back to those around us. So we reflect the good that God has um, back to those around us. There's so much in today's world that says... I don't need doctrine. It doesn't matter which day you go to church as long as you go to church, right? I don't have to have a bunch of rules and regulations in my organized religion. I don't need that. We, when I worked at the NAD, I did a a survey of young people every 10 years called Value Genesis. And I, um, I had the opportunity to be involved in what those questions are. And the real, the real focus of that research was faith, uh, faith within, the, within the kids. Is it internal or external faith and all those kinds of things? But we ask about 60 or 70 questions of about 3,000 young people in the North American division. Um, some of them in schools, uh, in our schools, and some of those of them outside our schools. And um, one of the questions we ask is, is organized religion important? And what we found out in all those questions, and so we wouldn't take one question, we'd usually phrase it five different ways and then put those five together and build a picture coming at it from different directions. For instance, we would say, is organized religion important? And then we'd say, are you a spiritual person? Do you read your Bible? Do you pray? Um, do you have faith in God, et cetera, et cetera? And what we found out is 81% of the young people today feel that they're spiritual but have no use for an organized religion. That they, they pray and they, uh, they read their Bible, but they could care less about the Adventist church or the Lutheran church because they saw that as rules and regulations that didn't mean anything to them. I've shared with you many times that um, there are five distinctive beliefs in the Adventist church. And I, I'm the kind of person, I'm a teacher at heart. And so repetition is how we learn. So I say these things all the time, the same things, and eventually somebody's going to catch on. So there are five distinctive doctrines in the Adventist church. Can you tell me what they are? Sabbath, Sabbath sanctuary. the sanctuary service, state of the dead, um, yeah, um, there's two more. Ellen White, right? Spirit of Prophecy. And the last one nobody ever gets. Ah, we, have, we have a winner. We have a winner. And because we have talked about it a lot. The remnant church. Right? So those are the five distinctive doctrines of the Adventist church. Everybody, you know, the Trinity and... The nature of Christ, 
other religions have those same belief systems, but no, no other religion have those five. Nobody else talks about Ellen White or the sanctuary service. Um, when's the last time you heard a sermon other than an evangelistic sermon on the sanctuary service? And the value and the, the relevance of the sanctuary service to Adventism, right? We don't, we don't preach it much in the church. Only about 30, less than 30% of our young people go to Adventist education. And so 70% of our young people, if they're in Adventist education, I guarantee they learn about the sanctuary. Four times in the, in the Bible curriculum, grades 1 through 12, I've, I've helped write it. Four times, every single doctrine is hit four times at an appropriate age level through grades 1 through 12. So if you're in Adventist education, you will at least be exposed to the sanctuary service and its relevance to Adventism. But what about the other 70%? If they're, do we talk about it in Pathfinders, the sanctuary service? No. I know where they would get it. In family worship, sitting around the table at home. Less than 70% of the families. The, uh, only a few families anymore have family worship. You know, Sandy and I are reading the book Maranatha right now um, for our, our worship every morning and evening. And yesterday was on the sanctuary service in the book Maranatha. If we were having family worship, we would have touched on the relevance of the sanctuary service. Um, I've been preaching this. So, so let me back up. 70% of our kids don't get it at home. They don't get it in church. They don't get it in Sabbath school, and they don't get it in Pathfinders. Where are they going to get it? We have already lost two generations of their parents on those four of those five. The Sabbath is pretty solid. But the other four are very weak, and we've lost two generations of parents in general that don't understand those four doctrines. If we lose four of five unique doctrines in the Adventist church, where are we going to be as a people, as a church? We're going to be Sabbath-keeping Baptists and Sabbath-keeping Lutherans and Sabbath-keeping whatever because we will be the same as every other religion because we've taught the other 24. We believe in the other 24 doctrines, but those four we've kind of let go. That's our uniqueness. And I've been, I've been um, on this little diatribe for almost 20 years. And we're beginning, this lesson today is on one, or this lesson this quarter, <clears throat> is on one of those unique doctrines, the state of the dead, coming at it from different directions and the immortality of the soul. There is a reality in sound doctrine. It is not a vapor which passes away. Light is to shine forth from the Word of God. God calls upon His people to draw near to Him. Let no one interpose between Him. Who's Him? God and His people. Christ is knocking at the door of, and I've inserted, your heart. Seeking for entrance, will you let him in? This day with God, 308. Doctrine is important. So we're going to cover a number of areas today in these end time deceptions. All right? The first is called mysticism. Um, boy. I went to the eye doctor this week, and I need glasses, so you'll see me in glasses pretty quick. 
Um, it is popularly known as becoming one with God or the absolute. It may be, um, it may refer to any kind of trance or trance-like state in which a person transcends the normal. It is often given a religious spiritual meaning. Mysticism. We don't know it by that name today, right? But it's happening every single day. The devil has taken that mysticism, that, that um, transcending, going into a trance and, and, and speaking with others. Spiritualism asserts that men are unfallen demagogues. That's really what spirit, spiritualism is, is that we, have you heard that before, that we are God? What's that called? Humanism, right? That we are God. And each mind will judge itself that true knowledge places man above all law, that all sins committed are innocent, for whatever is right and God um, does not condemn. And here's the sentence. Um, the basis of human beings uh, it uh, represents is heaven and highly exalted there. We're, again, mysticism is saying, I'm God, and I want to talk to my relatives, and I want to talk to, um, I want to go into a trance so that I can be, um, I can get the, that spiritual aura all over me. Well, if we don't get that, where do we get that spiritual aura? We only get it from God, don't we? When we pray, and, and can, we, can we have that spiritual aura? When we pray, we can have a, we can have a relationship with God. And, and, I mean, I've had times in which I felt God was right there in the room with me. And it wasn't my ancestors. And I, I give that, that experience to God as His, not some trance, you know, giving it to me. Thus it declares to all men, it matters not what you do, live as you please, heaven is your home. You can't believe, so when I, when I get ready for these Sabbath school lessons, I go out and look what other churches believe. And I, I Google, you know, what Baptists believe about mysticism and what Latter-day Saints believe about mysticism and what um, <coughs> Lutherans you can't believe how many other religions believe that what you do doesn't really matter. That God loves you no matter what. And God is a God of love and would never want to, to do away with you. And so what you do, what they're really saying, if you, if you boil it down, what they're really saying is it doesn't matter what you do. God loves you no matter what, and he's going to forgive you. Matter of fact, he's already forgiven you. He died on the cross so that you don't have to feel guilty about what you do. That's exactly what one passage said, one author from another church, said God, that Jesus died on the cross and took your guilt so that you don't have to feel guilty about what you do. Is that the way it works? No. It's a partial truth. On the bottom. Is there a green light? Yep. So that is a partial truth. It is true that God has provided forgiveness. But what they forget is the part that says if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins right. and to 
cleanse us from, from most all, of our most, all, right? All unrighteousness. All of our, that's right. So the forgiveness was provided at the cross. It is there, but they forget that there's a further work that Christ does. That's right. This. Absolutely. And isn't that the way Satan works? I mean, in everything. He tells partial truth. There's some truth in what he says. There's some truth in, in his deceptions. But there's also some falsehood. And, and you buy into those truths and you get the falsehoods that come with it, like these other religions. They've bought into the, into the truth that there's grace at the cross, but they have left out that we must confess and be forgiven, and wear the robe of righteousness that Christ um, puts around us. Multitudes are thus led to believe that desire is the highest law, that license is liberty, and that men are accountable only to himself. Right? I can, I can decide what's right and wrong. Humanism says that. I can decide what's right and wrong. I can decide um, that grace is provided and so it doesn't matter what I do and believe that half-truth. The light given me, and who is this speaking? Ellen White, all right? I, I believe Ellen White has given us so much counsel that is relevant to today. I'm an unapologetic Ellen White supporter. I served on the, on the White Estate Board as a trustee for 20 years, and I believe that the counsel that Ellen White has given us is so relevant for today. And so many times we don't, we don't use that counsel to help us to learn and grow. Welcome. The light given to me has been forceful that many would go out, would go out from us, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. The Lord desires that every soul who claims to believe the truth shall have an intelligent knowledge of what is truth. I did a sermon here a while back. And what's it, what was it called? John knows. The truth. The truth about truth. The truth about truth. Right? The truth about truth. Lots of, lots of religions say we have the truth, right? And the Adventist church goes around saying we have the truth. I saw an interview one time with, with Tom Hanks, and he said, I went from religion to religion to religion, and I went to this religion, and they said they had the truth. And then I figured out that they didn't. And so I went to this religion who said they have the truth. And after a while, I figured out that they didn't. And so I went to this religion that said they had truth. And now I have no idea what truth is, and I don't believe in religion. The truth about truth. False prophets will arise and will deceive many. Everything is to be shaken that can be shaken. Everything that can be shaken will be shaken. Your faith in God, your faith in, in your pastor, the faith in the church, the faith in humanity. If it can be shaken, then the devil is going to go around like a roaring lion to devour all of us, right? And even the very elect... What? Will be deceived. Will be deceived. Not will, sorry, sorry. If possible, That's right. the very elect. 
If possible. Yeah. That's right. That's so a very good... Knowledge does not equate relationship with God. That's right. And what they teach now is that truth is individual. What is truth to you may not be truth to me, but I must respect your truth and you must respect my truth. That's right. They have left out that God is absolute truth and he is universally truth. That's right. And they don't see that. So any truth that they accept or espouse, and that's why we can be shaken. We need to have a thus saith the Lord. We need that's our right. feet grounded in the word. And that's humanism. R right. That's right. That's exactly my truth is my truth. Your truth is your truth. Right. Don't step on mine. I won't step on yours. Right. And a lot when you talk about mysticism, there's a lot of emotion that's that right. is counted as truth. I don't have to feel that God loves me to know that God loves me. His That's word right. says it. That's right. So I am not to be feeling based. I praise God every time I feel so excited and thankful or cry over a beautiful passage. I love that feeling. But that feeling is not truth That's right. always. Very good. Well said. Well said. Truth. I think truth is at the heart of all deceptions. And, and I've said this many times as well, your worldview, your worldview is where you believe truth is. If you take evolution, and I believe science is truth, and if science is truth, then the Bible can't be truth, right? Or if I, believe, if I believe Scripture is truth, and this is where truth, absolute truth, resides, then I have to question some science. And I believe that's the, the foundational difference, the foundational um, pivot point between creation and evolution, is where do I believe truth is? And it's the same way with many other aspects um, of, of Christianity. We need not be deceived. Do you believe that? How do you not be deceived? In the Word and on your knees. In the Word and on your knees, right? It's only if we understand what God has said can we then, you know, how do you, you have a, a nominal Christian who is searching and their mother dies. And that night they wake up and there's mom standing at the end of the bed saying wonderful things. Does that happen? It happens. The devil is, is able to do those kinds of things. That happens. And so how does that, how does that young woman laying in the bed with her mom at the foot of the bed determine that that's not her mom? How does she do that? Only by being in the Word. And knowing the difference, right? Yeah, knowing the difference between the five doors and the five and the eye and the eye. That's right. That's right. We, we need to understand. And that's why this whole quarter has been on the immortality of the soul. When we die, our soul sleeps. Right? Our soul sleeps. I've said um, before, I've got this friend who's a real estate agent, my real estate agent, her her husband died in, in the sleep next to her one night. She woke up and he was gone. But he never really left. She talks to him every day. She's a devout Catholic. She talks to him every day. And, and she's always saying, oh, Tom, I talked to Tom this morning and, and I know he's going to go out and find you a buyer for your house. I know that Tom is out there working on your behalf to find a buyer for your house. I mean, she says that all the time. And she means it. 
because she doesn't really understand. Wonderful scenes which Satan will be uh, closely connected will soon take place. God's work declares that Satan will work miracles. Do you believe that? Satan's going to work miracles? Sandy and I in our, our devotionals in the morning and some of what you'll see today came from that. Um, we've read passage after passage from Ellen White about the kinds of miracles that Satan will perform in end day time. Um, he will make people sick and then suddenly remove from them his satanic power. So you have this being that comes in white robes and he has made Chris really sick. But then he walks up to Chris and puts his hand on, his, on her head and said, be healed. And all of a sudden she gets up and starts walking. He made her sick and he removed that affliction from Chris. What do you think happens to those around? Do you think that they believe that's a miracle? Yeah. Absolutely. Would you and I think that's a miracle? We have to be so careful because is there going to be men walking around in white robes, um, walking up and putting their hand on Chris's head and, and healing her? Is that God? Is God going to walk around on the earth um, before he comes back again? We have to know. Go ahead. Then how do we determine right now, I mean, if, is that a miracle or is that Satan? Yeah, it's a perfect, perfect question, Barb, and a question we must all answer. And the only way to answer that question is to be grounded in Scripture. So, in my example, it says that Christ, when he comes back, will not touch the earth, right? That's what it says. But if this man in a white robe is walking around with this glory all around him, and he walks up and puts his hand on Chris's head, is that scriptural? So if, that, if there's something in the miracle that's not scriptural, it's not a miracle from God. That's, that's, a, that's the easy part of it. The harder part is I pray for... Um, I pray for my son to not have pain. Right, Chris? I pray, really happened. I pray for my son to not have pain. You're headed to the hospital. He's screaming in pain. And Chris raises her heart to God and said, would you take away that pain? I can't stand him in that kind of pain while I'm driving. And all of a sudden, Michael says, oh, I'm feeling better. Is that a miracle? See, is there anything unscriptural about what happened? I prayed to God, ask Him for something that is, that is heavy on my heart. Does God know our heart? Does God know what we need? And it's only by asking him that releases him to allow him to come. And does, does God go into Michael's life and force him to do anything, even not to be in pain? But the mother's fervent prayer for her son releases God's hands that he can go in and do that in Michael's life. That's called intercessory prayer. And so Barbara it's not always clear. It's not always black and white. This is Satan and this is God. It's what we, how we go into Scripture and how we, how we phrase that um, here and then over here. So I, a friend of mine bought me a gift of a massage 
Mm -hmm. And at the end of the massage, the massage therapist was waving her hands up and down my body but not touching me. And I said, what are you doing? <laughs> she said, I'm dispelling the evil spirits. And I'll tell you what, <laughs> if that had been the first part of the massage, I'd have said, oh, I, I'm not feeling too well, so I will pay you and thank you. But there are things that happen in your life that you cannot discern clearly, obviously, that you just must pray, God, keep me from, uh, what was David's sin? Keep me from unintentional sins. But Satan is going to come so cleverly that we just need to constantly cry out to the Lord and say, keep me in your will, keep me in your will, because we do not have the ability to discern the devil many times. So it's only a constant walk with God that will keep um, us going. That's right. That's just an experience I had that it was kind of frightening that I'd... And did you feel so much better after she got rid of those evil spirits? <laughs> Over here. Win the lottery, and right. all of a sudden you won the lottery. That would not be a miracle of God, because God says to give up material possessions. That's right. And greed is actually a sin. So it's also knowing who God is and His character and who He wants you to be. That's right. And and that's a really good point. Does, does Satan give us good things? Yes. At times he does. But are those good things usually good things in the end? There's always strings attached. There's always strings attached. Kind of like the federal government, right? <laughs> um, there's, no, uh, there's no direct connection between Satan and the federal government there, so um, don't say that I said that. <clears throat> Yeah, it's on camera. All right. <laughs> he will make people sick and then suddenly remove from them his satanic power. They will thus be regarded as healed. Please read this. These works of apparent healing will bring many Seventh-day Adventists to the test. Seventh-day Adventists, us, me, you. Many who have had great light will fail to walk in the light because they have not become one with Christ. That's a sobering quote. We're not talking about Satan going out and deceiving the Gentiles or the the Baptists were saying that many Seventh-day Adventists, many of those sitting in our pews today, will be, will be tested. And it's only... It's not only Seventh-day Adventists. It's just saying, even us, even us. Yeah, she was writing. This is Ellen White writing, you know... Yeah, not in selected messages. She was writing to, to Adventists and saying, even you guys, the very elect, can be deceived. And so we must know, when we see that white being walking around in a cloud of glory and, and healing people, you know, healing you and, and taking away their sins, we have to, to know our Bible well enough that we understand that that's a deception. Then the serpent said to the woman, you shall surely, you will not surely die. He's been preparing this, this deception since Eden. It's the same deception. Don't worry, you're not going to die. Don't worry, you'll see your mother again in a few minutes. Don't worry. The foundation of his work was laid at, uh, by the assurance given to Eve, ye shall, surely, ye shall not surely die. In the day ye eat thereof, 
Then your eyes shall be open, and ye shall be as God, knowing good and evil. Do we know good and evil? Do I wish I didn't know evil? So that's really what, what happened to Adam and Eve. They knew good, but they didn't know evil. And now we know evil, and we know it too well. Little by little, he has prepared the way for his masterpiece of deception in the development of spiritualism. Next section we're going to talk about is probably one of the most difficult that many Christians deal with. Because we're going to talk about near-death experiences. They almost die. They're right there. Their heart has stopped. And they're doing CPR. But their heart has stopped. Are they dead? Medically, their heart stopped. Um, There's no pulse. They're being mechanically kept alive, and I went on um, near-death occur- uh, experiences are, are occurrences in which a person comes very close to dying and has memories of a spiritual experience, such as meeting dead friends and family members or seeing a white light, than death when death was near. It is typically described as an out-of-body ex- uh, experience or vision of a tunnel of light. When positive, it can include a variety of sensations such as detachment from the body, feelings of levitation, total serenity, security, warmth, and the presence of a light. I went on to to YouTube and put um, life after death. There were over 500 videos of people that said, I died, and when I died, I felt myself lifting up out of the body and looking down on my body and looking around the emergency room and and wishing, and then I felt this warmth, and it goes on and on and on, talking about what happened after they died. Over 500 of those videos that are out there today on YouTube. It must be true. Yeah. If, it's, if it's on YouTube, it must be true. <laughs> for, the, for someone who is struggling with spiritual issues and have lost a loved one, it's a very tempting, very um, appealing concept that their loved one is right there and that they're watching over them and taking care of them every day. The immortality of the soul is exactly what we're talking about. And that's really one of the huge deceptions in end time. So I have a friend that is a Seventh-day Adventist and had an out-of-body experience. It was very interesting talking to her because it was, she was giving birth to her daughter. Her mother was in the room with her, and she said, I, I felt like I was above them looking down on all that was happening. And she said, my mother was crying because the baby wasn't crying. And she said, I desperately wanted to tell my mother, that's because they put a breathing tube in the baby, so he can't cry, but he's okay, or she's okay. And it was very interesting because of her understanding of death from the biblical perspective. She knew she was not out of her body, floating above her body. But there was an excellent audio verse presentation by a monk who used to meditate and uh, for hours. And he said it be- meditation became so addictive that he had to do it at least six to eight hours a day in order to feel normal. 
but he would shut down his brain, and he had studied the physiology. And when uh, they have studied people that meditate, and it shut down, shuts down blood flow to the frontal lobe. Mm -hmm. Now, the frontal lobe is the seat of reason and where God communicates. And the other areas of the brain that are shut down are proprioceptive areas, areas that tell you how you relate, like how my hand is close to this bench now. I'm sitting on the bench. Proprioception tells us without us cognitively thinking it, that where we are in relationship to our surroundings. So that area of the brain is shut down. And he said, then you begin to levitate, and then you enter a state of euphoria because you've shut down so many mental processes. Well, when people are near death, the body, the brain, chooses what areas to deprive of blood. So your legs and your arms, they're not going to get much blood. Your brain, your heart, your kidneys, your liver, they're going to get preferential treatment. Yeah. Your stomach's going to shut down. But there are parts of the brain that the brain will shut down when the body is in crisis and near-death modes. And thus, you can explain physiologically how they feel like they're floating because they're areas that perceive where they are in reality yeah. are not functioning. And many times they've been giving given drugs that, right. that also right. perpetuate those kinds of things. Yes, I levitate my patients all the time. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so I, did, I, I looked at life after death, and I could not find in the first 10 or 12 pages on Google any place that it talked about that there's not life after death. Most religions believe the immortality of the soul and there's different things some you know some go to heaven some go to purgatory some go to hell some are just floating around they have all different kinds of beliefs but i'm so thankful that that we have truth because it's scriptural that the soul sleeps um, until christ returns um, some see Jesus and some see hell. There's one of those videos that I didn't watch all of them. I just read the titles that said, I was so scared after I died that I became a Christian because I saw hell. And I didn't want to go there. And so I became a Christian. Reincarnation, Hinduism. Hinduism is this cycle where you live, you die, and whether you are... Um, good or bad determines what you come back as. If you're good, you come back as a human. If you're bad, you come back as a worm or a grasshopper. Necromancy and ancestor worship is the practice of communicating with the dead, especially to predict the future. And if you look at everything we have in our society today, we have this necromancy um, all the way through what we do. Uh, nearly all forms of ancient sorcery and witchcraft were founded upon the belief in communication with the dead. Those who practice the art of necromancy claim to have intercourse with uh, departed spirits and to obtain uh, through them a knowledge of future events. The custom of consulting the dead is referred to in prophecy of Isaiah when uh, they shall say this unto you, seek unto them that have familiar spirits, and upon wizards that peep into the, uh, and mutter, should not a people seek their God. All kinds of demonic um, appearances um, where people come back and appear to their loved ones. Um, and talk to them and tell them um, how much they love them and, and how much they want, they'll be with them forever. This way, um, they lead men to believe that their dead friends are angels hovering over them and communicating with them. Those who thus assume to be the spirit of the departed are regarded with a certain idolatry and with many 
uh, their word has greater weight than the word of God. I believe what my mother, my dead mother, told me at the end of the bed more than I believe what the word of God says. Are we defenseless? I don't know if you can read this. Um, the one on the left says, what are other words for defenseless, unprotected, helpless, vulnerable, exposed, naked, unguarded, unfounded, um, unarmed, weak, and defenseless? Are we defenseless? We are not. In Ephesians 6, one of my favorite passages in Scripture, one of my favorite passages, um, take on the whole armor of God. Finally, be strong in the Lord in His mighty power. Tell the, put on the full armor of God so you may take your stand. Your what? Take your stand against the devil's schemes. For a struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against authorities, against the powers in this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. And it goes on to tell all about the, the armor of God. Kind of like I was wearing some of that last night. Um, it's an awfully cold helmet of salvation, I'll tell you that. Um, <coughs> um, but it goes on and on and on in this passage saying, and having done so, what? Stand. Stand, stand up for what God has revealed to you. Um, we need not fear our confidence in God. He has power to deliver. We must, however, identify where our strength is and where our strength is and in whom our strength is, right? It's a cosmic battle that calls for a different kind of strategy, and that strategy is a spiritual strategy. There's a long story, I can't go into it because of time, about uh, Christians began to run a, a jail. And uh, they had, when this person went into the jail, Chuck Colson actually, um, it was run by Christians and they, there were no cells. They could come and go, they were all friendly, and they had one solitary confinement cell left. And the person that was guiding Chuck Colson around this prison said, would you like to see our, the prisoner that we have in the solitary confinement? And Chuck says, yeah, I've been in lots of prisons before, and I've been in isolation cells all over the world. And slowly he swung the massive door open, and I saw the prisoner that, that pun, in that punishment cell. A, crucified, a crucifix beautifully carved by the inmates. The prisoner Jesus hanging on a cross in that solitary confinement cell. He's doing time for the rest of us, my guard said slowly, softly. And that's really the issue. Take up my cross, my yoke. Um, we need not fall for deceptions. I ask a question at the end of every single Sabbath school lesson and end of every single sermon. So what? Unless you take something out of what we talked about today, it was an hour of entertainment. And that's not what it's all about. Christ is speaking to your heart. Are you going to listen today? And Let's bow our heads. Father, we're so thankful that you love us and that you have given us this lesson today. Help us to understand the difference um, between what Satan is going to share with us, and what God has already shared. We want to say we love you in Jesus' name. Amen.